Well, good day there, everybody. This is Joe Van Cleve. Welcome back to the channel. And today we're going to have the results from Typing Assignment 21. Stay tuned. We've had a lot of good suggestions over the last year or so that we've been doing these assignments. I really was interested in the idea of this inner monologue. You know, we have our own thought life. We have our inner voice that we constantly live with day in and day out. And for some of us, that inner monologue can be quite strong in, at times. If we're finding ourselves like standing in line or in a waiting room or something, some kind of idle time, oftentimes if we're not on our phones, that is, sometimes our thought life, our inner thoughts can really take hold of us and it becomes its own little world. And uh, I was really interested in seeing what you guys would do with this assignment and we had some very interesting results. So without any further ado, let's get into the results for Typing Assignment 21, Inner Monologue. George Bernstein is a new participant to this series, and he typed his on a 1936 Royal Portable O, and his piece is called Waiting in Line. This is the inner monologue at the market, and I can really relate to this because one of our other participants in this uh, episode is my wife, and she is also doing a piece on the supermarket, the grocery store waiting in line. So this is so funny. There is so much similarity between hers and George's here, but I can definitely relate to, in particular, what he talks about here with the checker, the, the slow checker that they put in the express lane, as he says, ha. And the old grocery store in our neighborhood, what we call creepy Albertsons, <laughs> has some really interesting checkers and it's entertaining if you have a certain degree of patience it's very entertaining to go there just to observe everything if you're not in too much of a hurry but i can definitely relate to george's piece and how you try to do the best you can you know you're trying not to be that guy that's or that lady that's slowing down everybody else you want to be efficient have your stuff there your divider in place you're not going to go back for anything else blah blah but there's always something that goes wrong usually right to make it a less than perfect uh, experience. But I really liked your inner monologue, George, and welcome to the series. David Cornelius' piece was written on a 1949 Ryan Mattal KST typewriter, and this is very original, David. I really enjoy this, and uh, he's talking about the purpose of for humans waiting in line, and, and a little tongue in cheek here, but perhaps you know we've been waiting in lines for the entire history of the species. I can remember standing in the chow line, the food line, while stationed on an aircraft carrier in the U.S. Navy, the USS Constellation, who is right now probably razor blades cut up for scrap metal. But anyways, back in the late 70s, waiting in that chow line, and the chow line at, at the noontime, which was the busiest time of day, would be so long that it would go down the hallway, the starboard side corridor, up the ladder way into the hangar bay, and back halfway up the hangar bay sometimes, sitting there waiting in line and watching people cut in line in front of you, of course, right? I really loved your piece, though. That is really funny. And you know, you, what you say about moving rocks as just an excuse to wait for the hunt or the harvest to come in as a, as a way of keeping from getting bored. And uh, But it wouldn't work in modern days, as you say, because what, reflective vests, helmets, permits, et cetera, et cetera, insurance, right? 
So maybe waiting is part of the human experience. And I think that's what you've touched on. And maybe in our fast paced modern culture, we don't really experience as much of that as our forebearers did. Really in interesting thoughts you bring up, David. Thank you very much. Diane Cox wrote her piece, The Unexpected Tour Guide on a Hermes 3000, and it is about at the art museum, the art exhibit, and it's really funny because I can certainly relate having seen recently in Albuquerque in the next last year or so, we've had a, a Pollock, a Jackson Pollock painting come through the museum. I need to go down to the Albuquerque Museum and uh, spend a little more time there. It used to be free admission before they remodeled it and have a, a paid fee, but I really do need to go down there. But I really like your idea of sitting around watching other people look at art and observing whether they can understand the art or not. And of course, your whole idea of posing as a relative of Jackson Pollock, I think is hilarious. <laughs> I'm going to have to think about that. That's very good. Uh, yeah, Jackson Pollock is one of those uh, painters that I've actually been rather interested in. And uh, I've seen some of the documentaries uh, that I think there's one that shows some old color film footage, like Super 8 footage or something of him throwing paint around in his barn that you mentioned, in his barn studio. But a very interesting piece you write there and a lot of interesting ideas it brings up. Thank you very much. Michael Kitchen's piece was written on a 1938 uh, Smith Corona silent. And this is interesting. This is really interesting. I know Michael is a lawyer. I didn't know he talked to the dead, but his piece is titled Some Ghosts Aren't Dead. And this is a very interesting story. And I think it stands on its own. It's, I don't need to say much about it. It's wonderful. I think you should write more like this. Write more about this, Michael. It's great. I really love it. Some ghosts aren't dead, but they haunt the corners of the mind where the what-ifs once laid dormant. What a great closing line. Great job, Michael. Thank you. And Diane Mayer's piece was written on a 1959 Olympia SG-1. And I love this piece because of its, it's so ordinary, the kind of a, of a mental dialogue or monologue that you would have in any part of the day. Well, first of all, she starts with her fountain pen, of course, and I know very much what it's like to get the blue-black ink on your fingers. But uh, she's talking about the ribbon selector on her uh, Olympia typewriter and... Uh, how it works and the ball bearings she uh, bought for her older Smith Premier typewriter. And uh, then the cat, Hogan, comes over to her. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of cat photos posted on the Facebook uh, Antique Typewriters page, and it really is interesting. There's something cats have about typewriters. Maybe it's because 
when you're on the typewriter using it, the cat knows you're paying more attention to the typewriter than to the cat. And so the cat has to go over and get in your way so you could pay attention to the cat. That's probably what it is. But this is really funny. A great inner dialogue that uh, is so real and so genuine. Thank you very much, Diane. This next piece is from John Monroe, and he wrote it on his 1955 Groma Calibri, whose call sign is A. And this is titled, This is My Cue, and this is really imaginative. I enjoyed this a lot, John. So these recruits are sitting around waiting, waiting and waiting interminable lengths of time, waiting to be taken into battle. Well, it turns out, of course, the mystery surprise is that they are typewriters, <laughs> and the recruits are being finally put to use as the recruiter comes into the barracks and takes all his toolboxes in with him and sets up his tool kit and his workbenches and all that. And yes, and this, in fact, this is John's typewriter collection himself, and that was very cool. The long wait was over. John's typewriter collection was about to be cleaned, repaired, and used. And it's also so true that we do have favorites in our collection, of course, like in the case of this story, the H and K saw so much time that the others often wondered if they would ever come back to barracks. Uh, and of course, K and H, I could assume is Calibri and Hermes. Uh, so <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, you know, I've always thought uh, for a long time that tried to personify my typewriters at times. You think about what would it be like? Is there really a consciousness there? You know, of course we know there's not. In practical terms, there's not. But still, the way they interact with us, these mechanical devices, they're, they're fairly complex. And uh, you always think, you know, they, each one has a certain personality, just like a car has a certain personality when you interact with it enough time. So that's very interesting, John. I really appreciate this story. Thank you very much. Andrew Nichols' piece was very original, called The Last Q, or The Last Q? Question mark. And of course, it is waiting in line to get to the pearly gates to find out one's final domain. <laughs> and I love the uh, whole train of thought that your character has in this piece, uh, Andrew. It's really funny. Yeah. Are you going to need your ID? What about the poor devil? Is everybody goes to heaven, the devil's all alone down there? And do they invite him for tea once in a while? Very funny, very cute, and uh, very original. Great job. And David Randall's piece was written on a 1956 Underwood Olivetti Letter of 22, and it is a, an Englishman in the queue at the bank. This is so great, so realistic. You know, you think you're going to get the right line. You check everybody out. Which one is the quicker one? And 
and there's always slow people in front of you, the storytellers, right, and all that, and you think you pick the right line, and right at the last, there's the lady in front of you with a bag of change. Oh, that's so funny, and lines are so much like that, and great job, David. I enjoyed this. Thank you. This next piece is from a newcomer to the series, Dorian Suprina of Croatia, who typed his piece on an Olympia Splendid 33. And this is a bittersweet story. Standing in line at the train station, waiting for the train, leaving the woman that left him, that jilted him. But, oh, there's a turn of events. She shows up again. He has a change of heart, and then she leaves him again. He's learned his lesson, and now he's waiting for another train. And the love of his life, his dear Clara, is gone once again. The broken heart, yes. How we can all relate, perhaps, to that story. I love this. It was a really great job, and you did great on it. Dorian, thank you very much for, for being a participant to the series. Welcome. Okay, the next piece is written by Andrea Van Cleve, my wife, on the 1957 Olympia SM3, and it's titled, What's for Dinner? Yes, the grocery store line. We've had several of these, and it is a common, common experience, is it not? And I can certainly relate to hers, because I know which grocery store she's at. <laughs> She's doing this ad, and I know some of the cashiers as well, but hers is really funny. And, of course, the whole thing is, at the very end of it, wondering, did I use all the eggs this morning? Yes. Oh, no. And I need bread also, and that's always the problem. You forget something after you've gone through that line. Ah, well, thank you very much, Andrea. I appreciate it. This was a fun assignment. I think any opportunity we have to take something from our inner mind, our inner voice, and put it on paper, express it through the means of the typewriter onto paper is a really interesting challenge, a creative challenge, and you guys did really well. I really appreciate your participation also in this series. Going forward, I suspect I might be doing this slightly less often. We've been doing it approximately once per month, and I'm contemplating moving the series to maybe once every other month or perhaps once a quarter. I'm not really sure which one I'm going to decide on, but uh, please leave your feedback. Leave some comments down below how you feel about that. And also, if you have any recommendations, any ideas for future typing assignments, please leave those also. Now, I have a, a resource, though, for some other typing assignment ideas which was this book called Creative Writer's Notebook, 20 Great Writers and 70 Writing Exercises. And the interior monologue idea was the first assignment in this book. But I may not necessarily be doing future assignments from the book, or I should say I may not be doing all of the assignments from the book, because, well, for instance, assignment number two is Finnegan's Wake. And I'm not sure if we're going to be doing that because not everybody's read Finnegan's Wake, obviously. But some of these, like, for instance, in Assignment 3, Family Members. Pick members of your family and write a description of them, etc. Well, there's a number of these things in here that are not specific to any particular piece of literature. So 
we might be picking some of the uh, future assignments from this book. But I know that out there there's also other writing resources uh, that g can give us creative prompts. And so I would, uh, again, encourage you guys, if you have any really good ideas for uh, future typing assignments, leave them down below. Also leave comments about how frequently you think we should be doing these. You know, some of us are still in the process of finishing our short story for the Cold Hard Type book project that Richard Polt has commissioned. And myself, <laughs> I've been busy today making finishing touches on my final draft before I actually put it in the final typewritten uh, version on paper. And so I know some of you out there might be involved in that as well. And so that may be taking up your creative energy from participating in typing assignments like these. But going forward, we certainly want to continue these. It's a great opportunity to stretch our writing legs and uh, also an opportunity to uh, get your work out there in this humble little channel of a few thousand people that watch. And I appreciate every one of you, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, a little technical background note here. Um, I've gone back to using my little uh, dynamic microphone on the stand. My overhead mic I was using was a little bit echoey. I have a harder table surface now. My new, my, I'll have to show you another behind the scenes video one of these days. I've built an entire new table. And so I, I have this synthetic wood flooring now. So it's a harder surface, more echoey, bouncy, less acoustically optimal so my shotgun mic that was up here was a little bit echoey and it wasn't really good so anyway we're back to the dynamic mic and so now I look more like Johnny Carson maybe maybe not well anyways this is Joe Van Cleve and thank you very much for your participation in the typing assignment series and until next time of course as always stay creative and have yourselves a great day bye bye